like this video, subscribe our channel and press the bell icon to get notification of all new videos. Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Best IELTS Preparation Pack. Get it now. The test is in four part. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look it. A man wants to find out about a language course. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full-time or part-time? Oh, I couldn't manage full-time as I work every day, but evenings would be fine and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway, but let me run through your options. We have a 12-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course. Or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels. Beginners, lower intermediate and upper intermediate, though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next Level 2 course begins on Monday the 12th of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I'd prefer the next course. The woman asks the man for some details about himself. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and complete the form. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H-A-G-A-R-T-Y? Uh, no. H-A-G-E-R-T-Y. Oh, OK. And your address, Richard? Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's ricky45, uh, that's one word, r-i-c-k-y-4-5, at hotmail.com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? I was born on the 29th of February, 1980. 1980? So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. 
No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, so I'll put down conversation. Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school. Uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes, but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrolment form, we'll contact you in about... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about an artist's exhibition. Look at questions 11 to 18. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 18. And now for some information on local events and activities. A couple of announcements for art lovers and budding artists alike. First, a new collection of artwork is going on show to the public next month in the form of an artist's exhibition. The exhibition will include many different types of art, over a hundred different pieces by 58 artists from the local area. It's being held at the Royal Museum, which, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the area, is located opposite the library in West Street, right on the corner. The actual address is number one Queen's Park Road. It isn't difficult to find. The exhibition will run for nine weeks and will begin on the 6th of October and continue until the 10th of December. So there's plenty of time for you to go along and have a look, and I'm sure that will be worth doing. What will you see there? Well, amongst the items on display will be some exciting pieces of modern jewellery, furniture, ceramics, metalwork and sculpture. To give you some examples, Local artist Kate Main will be there to discuss her collection of pots and bowls that she has made to resemble garden vegetables. They're the sort of thing that would brighten up any dining table and range from things like yellow cabbage-shaped bowls to round tomato-shaped teapots. Prize winner Cynthia Corse will also be there to talk about her silver jewellery, all of which she produced using ideas from the rural setting of her country home. Some of her rings are quite extraordinary and have beautiful coloured stones in them. Or, if you prefer sculpture, there's plenty of that too. Take, for example, Susan Cupp's sculpture of 25 pairs of white paper shoes. It sounds easy, but believe me, it looks incredible. All of these items, along with many others, will be on sale throughout the exhibition period. As part of the exhibition, there will be a series of demonstrations called Face to Face, which will take place every Sunday afternoon during the exhibition, and these will provide an opportunity for you to meet the artists. 
Now look at questions 19 and 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 19 and 20. The second set of activities are for those who would prefer to indulge in some artwork themselves. The Artists' Conservatory are holding a series of courses over the autumn period. The courses cover all media and include subjects such as Chinese brush painting, pencil drawing and silk painting. All the tutors are experienced artists. Course sizes are kept to a minimum of 15 and there will be plenty of individual assistance. All the sessions offer excellent value for money and the opportunity to relax in a delightful rural setting. Fees are very reasonable and include the use of an excellent studio and access to the art shop, which you will find sells everything from paper to CDs, and they also include the provision of all materials. For more information on dates, cost and availability, you should get in touch with the programme coordinator on 4592 839 584 or go direct to the website, which you will find is... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between Anne and Marcia. In the first part of this conversation, they are talking about the commands of training dogs. First, look at questions 21 to 25. Note the examples which have been done for you. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Complete the table showing different commands for different forms of dog training. So that research paper we have to do next, the one about how are different styles of training dogs, how do you think you'll approach writing it? You know, I've been thinking about it. I feel that the best way to write it is to divide the paper into two main parts. In the first part, we'd be analysing some examples of each style of training dogs. Right, what the styles are. After that, we can talk about how each style can be used so that the dogs learn something different from each one. Indeed. Maybe we could draw a chart and compare examples of each style of training, one at a time. So the different kinds of training would be simple obedience training. There you would have things like teaching them to sit, stay in one place and so on. Right. So included in here would be simple audio commands like speak. Yes, basic commands are just spoken words, aren't they? And then there would be the more guard-oriented training, where the dogs are trained to know a specific place well. Patrolling and barking are probably the best examples, because most people have seen them in many places, especially in homes. And this would lead us to the attack dog training, which is physical as well as spoken, training the dog to knock someone down and even biting if they have to. Right, so there's another category as well, sniffing dogs which make up the searching category. I've read that in the UK every major airport and government building has these dogs to search for all kinds of dangerous items. In the second part of the conversation, Anne and Marcia talk about all kinds of training and what kind of dogs they are suitable to. Look at questions 26 to 30.
As you listen to the conversation, match A, B, C with the following forms of dog training. One has been done as an example for you. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. I can believe that. Well, we have a good list to build on. We're finally getting started now. So let's try to figure out when each type of dog training should be used. I guess we can start by trying to figure out the best situation for each type of dog training. Hmm, what do you mean? What I mean is whether each type of training should be used with different kinds of dogs. We could use basic obedience training, for example, and ask whether it's more useful for a small dog, a medium-sized dog, and so on. In this case, I'd say obedience training is best with small dogs because they tend to get excited easily and this will help keep them out of trouble. OK, that makes sense. Then let's look at physical training. Even though some people think it's ideal for every breed of dog, I think it's better suited to the larger kinds. Small dogs usually just aren't smart enough to understand the physical commands and they can even get hurt from them. The specialised sniffing training is the same. I think they're better with the more intelligent breeds of dogs, and they're hardly ever useful with really small dogs. Attack training, however, can be useful for every kind of large dog, as long as the dog is treated well and given a lot of care and attention. All right, and what about guard training? Barking is an ideal way for small dogs to guard a home. I know they aren't big enough to stop a person, but making some noise is often all a dog needs to do. Other kinds of guard training like biting though are different. I'd always plan to teach those to a smart dog, give them a chance to use their brains and defend their homes. I'd have to agree. Trainers often just teach large dogs to bark at a person when they think something isn't right. But if they know how to use physical skills in a bad situation, they could save their owner's life someday. Yes, I suppose that different people would have different needs for their pets. Right, and different trainers would recommend different methods for different breeds. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk from a member of the Conservation Society talking about green cleaning. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here as a representative of the Conservation Society to talk to you about green cleaning. In other words, about ways you can help to save the environment at the same time as saving money. I'll start with saving money, as we're all interested in that, especially students who are living on a tight budget. Probably none of you has sat down and calculated how much you spend on cleaning products each year, everything from dishwashing detergent, window cleaners and so on, through to shampoos and conditioners for your hair, and then those disasters products to get stains out of carpets, or to rescue burnt saucepans. I can see some nods of agreement. Even if you don't spend a lot of time on housework, you'd end up spending quite a lot of money over a period of time, wouldn't you? We can save money on products and also use products which are cheap, biodegradable and harmless to the environment. These I will call green products. 
Unfortunately, most cleaning products on sale commercially are none of these, and many of our waterways and oceans are polluted with bleach, dioxins, phosphates and artificial colourings and perfumes. Also, think how many plastic bottles each household throws away over a year. They'll still be around in landfill when you are grandparents. So we often feel there's nothing we can do to make a difference, but we can. The actual recipes are on handouts you can take at the end of the talk. The sorts of ingredients I'm referring to are things like bicarbonate of soda, eucalyptus oil, ammonia, vinegar, lemons, pure soap. Lastly, many people find they are allergic to modern products. So for all you asthma sufferers, keep listening. Nothing in these recipes should cause you any problems. An end to itching and wheezing. Now you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. So, let's start with spills and stains. Soda water is wonderful as an immediate stain remover. Mop up the excess spill. Don't rub, but apply soda water immediately. It's great for tea, coffee, wine, beer and milk as is salt or bicarbonate of soda, which will absorb the stain. Then vacuum when dry and shampoo if necessary. While we're talking about disasters, let's quickly look at some others that can be avoided. Bicarbonate of soda is wonderful for removing smells, especially in the fridge. An open box in the fridge will eliminate smells for up to three months and those terrible burnt saucepans, either sprinkle with our good friend bicarb again and leave it to stand, or cover with vinegar and a layer of cooking salt. Bring it to the boil and simmer for 10 minutes, then wash when cool. Much cheaper than a new saucepan. Then there are heat rings on wooden furniture. Simply rub with a mixture of salt and olive oil or for scratched furniture, use olive oil and vinegar. Now, let's look at general cleaning. First, the floors. If your floor covering is made of slate, cork or ceramic tiles or lino, it probably only needs a mop or a scrub with vinegar in a bucket of water. Carpets can be shampooed using a combination of pure soap, washing soda, cloudy ammonia and some boiling water. You put a small amount of this mixture onto the mark on the carpet, rub with a cloth until it lathers and then wipe off the excess. A smelly carpet can be deodorised by sprinkling bicarbonate of soda on the surface, leaving overnight and vacuuming off the next day. Cleaning in the kitchen, bathroom and toilet is the next section. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.